All right, well, I'd like to welcome everyone to our second debate of the ISS TDR and the Brazilian Conference. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Klausner. I'm going to moderate the beginning of the uh, debate, and then my colleague Valeria is going to moderate the uh, second aspect of the debate. And tonight's debate question is, should PrEP, pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV, be available on demand? So uh, before we start, uh, we usually try to take a poll and get a sense of where the audience is on this position. So please raise your right hand if you believe uh, PrEP should be available on demand. Okay, uh, my quick calculation is that's about 50 per, 55%. And then uh, how many people think PrEP should not be available on demand? Raise your left hand. All right, that's about 30%, and there's a bunch of people who have not responded. Um, so through this debate process, we hope to um, educate and uh, perhaps provide a small bit of entertainment. So our first, um, our, our, our first position of the pro will be... Um, led by um, Professor Matthew Golden. Uh, Matt and I were infectious disease fellows together in 1997 under the uh, mentorship of uh, Professor King Holmes. So I've been uh, working uh, with Matt, I guess, makes it 20 years, so two decades. Um, he is currently the, um, the director of the integrated um, HIV and STD program for Seattle uh, King County. He is an infectious disease specialist. He's board certified in internal medicine. He is an attending physician at Harborview and at the Seattle uh, Madison HIV clinic. He's well known in this research uh, setting for his numerous uh, publications and, and, and positions. So he has 10 minutes to present to you the pro side and then um, Professor Grinstein will um, present the con side for 10 minutes, then they will um, be a rebuttal for five minutes each, and then we will uh, vote again. And perhaps, um, given we're starting early, uh, we'll also have some time for some audience uh, comments as well. All right, are you ready, sir? I am in. All right, go. Okay, and is this the combined data set, can, or slide set? Can you confirm that for me? You don't know. Okay, so just to be clear, because Beatrice just pointed this out to me, when we say PrEP on demand, what we're talking about is the patient asks for PrEP, and we give the patient PrEP. So I'm going to be arguing the pro side. It's an honor to be here, and I want to thank uh, the organizers of the conference for giving me this opportunity. So I think it's important as we think about this that we define what we're talking about. And from my perspective, supporting PrEP on demand is not advocating an untargeted approach to PrEP promotion. It's saying that people who want PrEP overwhelmingly have a good indication to receive it. And as we think about this question, we need to consider different uh, epidemiologic contexts. So high income nations with concentrated epidemics affecting men who have sex with men and transgender persons low- and middle-income nations with concentrated epidemics, like Brazil, and low- and middle-income nations with generalized epidemic as it occurs in much of sub-Saharan Africa. Now, the World Health Organization recommends that PrEP uh, be available to people who are at substantial risk for HIV infection, with substantial risk being defined as an incidence of 3% or greater. But other organizations have recommended 2% or greater, and the reality is, in different contexts, the number defining substantial risk has varied substantially. This slide shows indications for a PrEP in one high income in nation, the United States. I'm an American, so I thought I would concentrate on that one. And if you look at the indications for men who have sex with men, the population among whom 70% of new infections occur in the United States, those indications are any condomless anal intercourse in the last six months that's outside uh, the context of a uh, seroconcordant mutually monogamous relationship any bacterial STI, or having an HIV positive partner. And CDC rec uh, estimates that approximately 25% of American MSM will meet one of those criteria. Now, as you look at how PrEP is rolling out in the United States, you can see that uh, it appears that it's really affecting men overwhelmingly. These data come from uh, retail pharmacy data, and you can see 
Overwhelmingly, this is men. Now, other data looking at 2015 suggested with about 80,000 people on PrEP, 97.5% of those people were men. The data don't break this down between men who have sex with men and men who have sex with women only, but it is consistent with the idea that PrEP use is overwhelmingly occurring in MSM. Now, if we drill down on this a little more in a specific jurisdiction, concentrating on King County, Washington, since I know something about that place since I worked there, we have more specific recommendations related to PrEP, and we have a two-tier recommendation system. In our highest tier, we have a population where we say the medical provider should recommend PrEP initiation, not discuss PrEP initiation, not consider. And those are men who have an HIV-positive partner who's off antiretroviral therapy or is not suppressed. The other group would be men who have sex with men or transgender persons who have sex with men, who use methamphetamine or poppers, who have early syphilis or rectal gonorrhea in the last 12 months, or are commercial sex workers. We then have a second tier recommendation where we recommend that the medical provider discuss PrEP with the patient. And that would be men who have sex with men or transgender men, uh, persons who have sex with men who have any condomless anal sex outside of seroconcordant uh, monogamous relationships. People who have other bacterial sexually transmitted diseases than the ones I've already mentioned. Those who have an HIV positive partner who is not suppressed, female sex workers, people who inject drugs, people completing non-occupational PEP, and patients who just ask for PEP. PrEP. So at least in a place like Seattle, we really have as an indication just wanting to have PrEP. And in surveys of over 100 medical providers who we know are PrEP providers, 61% say that they have never decided not to give PrEP to somebody who wants it. So we're pretty close to a PrEP on-demand environment. Well, how does that pan out? So these data come from an internet-based survey that we did earlier this year, so it's very recent data. And we divide in this figure the population up based on their indications. Looking at the population who had that first tier indication, those for whom we would recommend PrEP initiation, 37% are currently on PrEP and another 36% are interested in initiating PrEP. Looking at our second tier recommendation, 32% are currently on PrEP and 35% are interested in initiating PrEP. But when we look at the people who are in a lower risk group, who do not have either of our indication groups, only 5% are on PrEP and only 14% are interested. So what it would suggest to me is that in a PrEP on demand environment, we really are focusing on people who are at very high risk, that the system does seem to be working. Well, what sort of impact could that potentially have? These data, this figure comes from a mathematical model uh, that Sam Janess developed. And if you look at the circle here, that would be the range of impact I think uh, we're probably looking at. So the x-axis is showing coverage and the y-axis adherence. And I think at least based on this model, at a current use, we have the potential to invert somewhere between 20 and 40% of the cases. So PrEP could work. The problem is going to be, do the patients really have access to medical providers who are gonna provide it to them at the level we really want? nationally. Now these data come from a survey we did of multiple different parts of the United States over the internet uh, in 2014. And if you look at all MSM who participated in the survey, which was over 1,500 people, only 50% said that they had a medical provider who knew that they had sex with other men. And that number was lower if you were a young MSM, it was lower if you were black, and it was lower if you lived in the southern United States. So. What this means is that I would say requiring that medical providers ascertain risk information could end up being a barrier to PrEP and moreover a barrier that exacerbates existing disparities within the HIV epidemic in the United States. So in looking at high income nations, what I would say is we're beginning to see high levels of PrEP uptake in selected areas. Near on-demand availability seems to lead to high, the use of PrEP really only in high-risk populations and PrEP use remains low in many areas with populations that are highly affected by HIV. So I guess what we have to say is how strongly do you feel like we need the patients to tell us about all their HIV risks before we're gonna be willing to give them this intervention? And will insisting on having this information being a barrier to PrEP reaching the people we really wanna reach? Now changing context a little bit to think about concentrated epidemics in low and middle income countries, which I think is really much more the Latin American scenario. Uh, and it's, you know, this is a different social, political, and economic uh, context. However, we do have some data uh, that Dr. Greenstein actually provided to us. 
And these are data from the Brazilian uh, studies looking at willingness to use PrEP. And what you see is willingness to use PrEP is higher if you have a higher perceived likelihood of getting HIV, higher if you have more than two male sex partners in the last 12 months, higher if you have anal sex with someone who's HIV positive or don't know their status, and higher if you've had an STD in the last 12 months. So in other words, you know, I realize it's just willingness to use PrEP, but it's consistent. And I guess I'd say to you, who you know, many of you know much more about Latin America than I do, is there really any reason to believe that demand will be high in low-risk people here in Latin America? And do we think that MSM and transgender persons in Latin America are more likely to be out to their doctors than they are in the United States, where it's clear they aren't out to their doctors frequently? Now, the hardest group in some ways as we think about this is uh, the, the generalized epidemic uh, in low-income countries. Here you're seeing selected indications for PrEP recommended by the South African HIV Clinician Society in 2016. And I'm focusing here on their recommendations for heterosexual men and women. You can see these recommendations are extremely broad. I mean, they would incur, include things like inconsistent condom use or no use of condoms, and sex under the influence of alcohol, which I suspect many in the room would meet this criteria. So the demonstration projects are ongoing, and, and we've heard about that some here uh, in adolescents and sex workers. But if you think about it, this, I know this is a little counterintuitive. There is a optimal uh, resource optimization models, and this is what this slide is showing you here. The red line is if we concentrate antiretroviral use on as tasks, so treatment is prevention, and the blue line is PrEP. Here what you're looking at is the number of people treated and the available treatment. So at this time, currently available treatment in South Africa is about three million uh, people can be treated. At least within this resource optimization model, the right thing to do is actually use all the, the antiretrovirals for PrEP if your goal is to avert transmission. Now I realize this is a model and we want to minimize morbidity, not just minimize transmission, but it does make, suggest that making PrEP available on demand really may make sense even in an environment with a generalized epidemic uh, like South Africa. So I would say in conclusion, PrEP on demand is not undirected use of PrEP. There's no evidence that people at low risk for HIV want PrEP and good evidence that people who go on PrEP are at risk. The model suggests that PrEP could make a difference in bending the curve of the HIV epidemic and that appears to be true in diverse settings. It's often difficult to identify people at high risk who are often from stigmatized populations. Now I'd also point out that I've made this case principally on the basis of public health considerations. But the highest principle of medical ethics is autonomy, that the patients get to make decisions for themselves about what they want. And it is important that we see this as from our position as medical providers and not just as public health people. There has traditionally and there often is some tension between individual patient interests and public health, but in this case I think it's exaggerated. And focusing on that tension just recapitulates the false dichotomy that impeded the scale up of antiretroviral therapy for treatment for so many years. So from my perspective, PrEP on demand is the right choice. Thank you very much, Professor Golden. You are one minute and 22 seconds over. So uh, we will allocate an additional one minute and 22 seconds to Professor Greenstein. Coordinated. We both are going to be slightly old. My name is Valeria Saracini, and I'm. But to introduce Beatrice Christian, a physician and infectious uh, diseases specialist, the head of the STI AIDS lab of the National Institute of Infectious Disease here, Evandro Chagas at Fiocruz. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Christian. So good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a pleasure to do the position against the argument Dr. Golden just talked to us so brilliantly. So 
as already mentioned, the oral prep uh, containing TDF should be offered according to the WHO guidelines as an additional prevention choice for people at substantial risk of HIV infection as part of a combination HIV prevention approach. It's a strong recommendation with high quality evidence. So, however, uh, a few key points need to be addressed when uh, we discuss the issue of uh, on-demand or targeted PrEP indications. First of all, the epidemiological context of concentrated versus generalized epidemics, and second, and very importantly, who is paying the bill? The government, donors, health insurance, out of the pocket. All these aspects makes uh, uh, differences in the different environments and in the different epidemiological contexts. So PrEP is not a standalone intervention. It is to be provided within the context of combination HIV prevention, where the client will be approached and uh, every aspect, all aspects related to uh, HIV and risk management should be discussed, and PrEP would be only one of those interventions to be discussed and offered, and uh, if applicable. So, in the scenario of concentrated epidemic, uh, I don't support PrEP on demand. Uh, not supporting PrEP on demand is advocating for a targeted approach to PrEP promotion for those under higher risk for HIV infection. And this, I'm, I'm contextualizing this for the concentrated epidemics, but this is a general uh, statement. Data from demonstration studies both in high and middle income countries show that those who search for PrEP are at higher risk for HIV infection and tuned with the advances in HIV prevention. One thing Dr. Golden mentioned is our own data from uh, PrEP Brazil where we, where we shown that individuals with higher risk were willing to use PrEP and not only willing to use PrEP but when we actually assessed adherence with uh, blood levels of drug at week four, we could verify that not only they were willing more but they were using more drug if they had more risk. However, that study was the first, it is the first demonstration study in the country, and who were the people who most searched for PrEP Brazil? Those who knew about PrEP, those who had higher schooling levels, and this is different than the majority of people who are in need of PrEP and will be in need of PrEP in the next year. So we can't use this example of people who are, the, who are in the first wave as those who will be uh, those, the clients for PrEP in the future. So from a public health standpoint, when implementing an intervention, we should be inclusive. We need practical strategies for reaching those who need PrEP, including but not limited to self-referrals. We do not have evidence to prescribe PrEP for individuals out of the criteria used in clinical trials and demonstration projects. As such, we need to focus on high-risk persons. Increased PrEP literacy in the communities will help us create demand and expand PrEP use beyond those who are able to search for PrEP. Increased risk perception and discuss risk management are critical pieces to expand PrEP use among those at higher risk. And information about risk practice are critical to target PrEP use for those at higher risk. Not requiring medical providers to ascertain risk can lead to missed opportunities to encourage the discussion of other issues such as risk perception, risk management, combination prevention, post-exposure prophylaxis, and STIs. For instance, a part, uh, someone can uh, come to you uh, and PrEP may not be the issue that needs to be dealt in that appointment because he must be uh, in need to use PEP. So a broader discussion about uh, the status, the risk status, would really bring a more comprehensive approach for that individual. The lack of need to discuss risk in a non-demand PrEP delivery model can be, even, can be harmful. 
People with undiagnosed HIV infection who start pre-exposure prophylaxis will probably develop resistance, which could reduce their treatment options in the future. This factor emphasizes the importance of adequate risk assessment and proper identification of those who may need targeted, as, uh, targeted assessment to exclude the diagnosis of HIV acute infection prior to PrEP initiation. So, I bring here some data from Dr. Bookbinder uh, from a secondary analysis from the IPREC study. So for maximum effect, PrEP should be targeted to those subpopulations that account for the largest proportion of infections, population attributable, attributable fraction, and for whom the number needed to treat to prevent infection is lowest. So in this secondary analysis for the, from the IPREC study, uh, it was shown that PrEP may be most effective at the population level if targeted toward MSM and transgender women who report condomless receptive anal intercourse, even if they perceive their partners to be HIV negative. Substance use history and testing for STIs should also inform decisions to start PrEP. And uh, looking at those who had only one partner and only insertive anal sex practices without the condom, they, these uh, populations had the highest uh, numbers needed to treat to prevent uh, infection. So would not be the target. Sorry. Other things to be uh, discussed are the re resource allocation allocation prioritization. So potential PrEP users might also factor uh, cost into decisions if this is an out-of-the-pocket uh, way to acquire PrEP. At a societal level, discussions might also occur about prioritization of PrEP over other healthcare needs, including provision of ARVs to HIV-infected people. Modeling studies uh, also suggest that the impact and cost effectiveness of PrEP will be greatest when used by populations at higher risk of HIV infection. That is, those that have an HIV incidence of about 3 per 100 percent years of high or higher. So, in this sense, I brought here some day, uh, results from a cost effectiveness study that was done for, with people from my group and uh, from people uh, from the Harvard School of Public Health using the CPAC model with the objective to assess the clinical impact, costs, and cost effectiveness of PrEP compared to no PrEP in our, in our environment in Brazil, PrEP targeted for MSM and transgender women. I will give you a very, very brief overview of that because it's out of the scope of our uh, discussion here. But the bottom line is that using the model and using the parameters from our, uh, from our database, we, what we saw is that, uh, I'm sorry, we could show that HIV infection risk over five years decreased for, from 162 with no PrEP to 25 per 1,000 high-risk men with PrEP. Over a lifetime horizon, PrEP reduced HIV infection risk by 80% and HIV attributable, attributable mortality by 91%. And also, as you can see in this slide, uh, person, per person life expectancy increased from 20.7 to 23 years. But most importantly, I would like to show you these several graphs that demonstrate the robustness of our finding in sensitivity analysis of the key parameters that were used. This shows the ICER as we vary PrEP efficacy on the horizontal axis and HIV incidence rates rate on the vertical axis. Blue denotes cost saving, green denotes an ICER less than GDP per capita, and yellow denotes, denotes an ICER greater than GDP per capita. The black X denotes the result at base case efficacy of 86% based on the Proud and Ypres gay results, and incidence of 4.3% per 100 person years, that was the incidence 
uh, that was shown, that, that happened in Brazil uh, in the placebo arm of the IPREC study. So this was the incidence that was used in the model. We find PrEP is cost effective even if PrEP efficacy decreases to 44% efficacy, if the, but if the incidence rate is above one per 100 person years or higher, shown by the red triangle. Sorry. N notably, our case scenario assumed an incidence rate from IPREX, as I showed, where PrEP is always cost effective or perhaps even cost saving. Uh, again, PrEP is cost effective across all plausible efficacy levels if we maintain the incidence rate for 4.3 and remains cost-effective if, if incidence is, abo is above one per 100 person years. So now moving into low and middle income nations with a generalized epidemic. So in the left you can see the selected indications for, for PrEP based on the South African HIV Clinician Society guidelines that were released last year. And uh, as you all know, the HIV epidemic in Africa is complex, and outside of key populations, we have the fisher folk and slum dwellers as examples, are examples of populations at substantial risk of age for HIV infection. In addition, we also know that young women, pregnant and postpartum women, are at high risk for infection, more so those who live in high prevalence geographical locations. So we need practical strategies for reaching those who need PrEP, including but not limited to self-referrals. Defining a marketing approach using epidemiological data and offering, offering an appropriate, convenient, safe avenue for delivery may get to the people at greatest risk without introducing stigma. Another point is that PrEP use is not lifelong. Young women, MSM, sex workers, and HIV serodiscordant couples are not at uniform risk throughout their lives, and thus PrEP need not to be lifelong. Time-limited use of PrEP as a product to be used during the seasons of high risk is an important message for both the health provider and the client. And on-demand implementation may miss these nuances and lead to inadequate resource utilization. In conclusion, PrEP on-demand is indirect use of PrEP. No evidence exists that PrEP on-demand will increase uptake among those at higher risk. PrEP on demand may be perceived by the community as a stigmatizing recommendation, as uh, groups that are already stigmatized, stigmatized will be on spot uh, all the time. Cost effectiveness analysis show PrEP is cost effective among high risk individuals. There is no data showing that PrEP is cost effective if used more broadly. Resources may be consumed without having the highest impact on the HIV epidemic. If appropriately used, PrEP could make a difference in bending the curve, the curve of the HIV epidemic. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic. I really was not expecting you to be able to hit so many home runs against Professor Golden like that. And, you know, people don't know, but uh, Professor Golden and I have argued about the use of expedited partner therapy among men who have sex with men, and he's used uh, your arguments that there's uh, no evidence that we should do counseling and risk reduction, that there's missed opportunities against implementing uh, expedited partner therapy, and those were the same arguments you, you brought forward. And then lastly, you use the American knockout punch of using data from Harvard. I mean, there's never a stronger um, socket to me than uh, quoting uh, evidence that's been created by, you know, man's greatest hospital, MGH and Harvard University. So now we've, we've taken a little bit of a turn in terms of how we're going to do the rebuttal, right? right? So uh, we've decided that the presenters are going to rebut themselves. 
So uh, <laughs> Professor Golder has now five minutes to uh, provide his own rebuttal. Right, and later I can deal with Dr. Klausner's font of misinformation. <laughs> so are, do we have slides up? So can we pull the slides back up? Maybe? So we'll go backwards. All right, there we go. So we're going to do self-rebuttal in this particular case, which will be uh, a change. And you know, basically what this is showing is that I'm basically argumentative even to myself. And based, you know, I sort of feel strongly both ways on this particular point. And in preparing this, my argument here, what I decided to do was to rely on the input of my teenage children who have been very helpful in recent years in identifying the many faults of my character, uh, the problems in my thinking, and providing uh, suggestions on how I could be a better person. So my first argument was that low-risk people uh, don't want PrEP. But my youngest son would point out, you don't know that. 30% of the U.S. healthcare expenditures are actually unindicated. It's over $700 billion a year of unindicated medical care. The American Board of Internal Medicine has actually launched a program called Choose, Choosing Wisely to try to convince physicians and patients to stop getting tests and medical care that they don't need. So, you know, of course patients at low risk are going to want PrEP. Just wait. They don't know about it yet. Now, the second argument was PrEP can make a difference at achievable levels of coverage. Uh, my second son would argue, you're weak, and so is your argument. I mean, HIV transmission models are entirely unvalidated. We actually don't have any idea how much PrEP might influence the epidemic, what kind of coverage we would need in which populations, or how to balance resource allocations to avert transmission. And the third argument that optimal use of resources in generalized epidemics include widespread use of PrEP. My oldest son would say, you just don't understand math. What kind of doctor are you anyhow? I mean, we're at a point right now where we anticipate we're going to need over 10 million more people to be on antiretroviral therapy in sub-Saharan Africa alone in 2030. Where is that money going to come from to treat all those people? The, right at present, the majority of people in low-income countries in the world are being treated with money that comes from the United States government. Do we actually believe that the United States government is going to increase PEPFAR under the current environment to meet the needs of those many millions of people? So we need to treat the people who will die if we don't treat them. And PrEP needs to be very highly targeted, not based on an on-demand model. So in summary, I'd say we need to bring scale up PrEP, but that effort needs to be carefully targeted, particularly in low-income country, and PrEP on demand is not a reasonable strategy. So definitely I'm not as good as Dr. Golden in rebutting myself. There may be reasons for that, but it's not the appropriate environment to discuss those. Anyway, I'll try. So the first point I would like to bring is that autonomy is the highest principle of medical ethics, as Dr. Golden has already uh, talked about. And we have been championing for individual rights all our lives, you know, and my body I want to make the decisions of what I want to do. So I think that this point is critical and needs to be respected. So if I come to you and I want to use PrEP, why should I need to share with you my risks? So I think that 
first word is autonomy. The second point I would like to discuss with you is criminali criminalization. As you well know, in several countries, homosexuality is criminalized and people can be incarcerated or can be killed. So how can we make a decision to have a technology such as PrEP use it only for high-risk people, meaning that this will further stigmatize uh, individuals who will be even more aparted from health settings. So I believe that this is not what we aim with PrEP, uh, avoiding people in need to use it only because we want to target it to those under higher risk. As we have shown, those at higher risk know what they need to do, so they will search for PrEP. And so we don't need to have it discussed at this level with the providers. And m more than this, having services that will be labeled as services who are serving high-risk individuals. So this is not what we want. Uh, in implementing PrEP, the approach of targeting can be stigmatizing and become a barrier to uptake, and that's not what we want at all. So PrEP should not be branded only for promiscuous individuals which may limit access and backfire by limiting demand. Um, Another point is that for certain populations, especially uh, in uh, generalized epidemics, it's even more difficult to understand exactly who is a high-risk person. So if you go and, and talk to a young woman in sub-Saharan sub Africa, it's, 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 hard, it's very hard to, to get the sense of high risk. So it's a difficult conversation. So, how we, can we restrict PrEP use for these populations? So I would argue then that limiting PrEP is against a public health uh, decision, so I think that PrEP should be delivered on demand for those who want it. Thank you. Well, that was excellent. Uh, thank you both for those uh, 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 talking and retalking yourselves. <laughs> so, that's good. Nice to hear that you, you still, I don't know, are you a pro or against? Am I pro or against? The, the on-demand prep, because, you know. Right. Uh, you know, I think it's a lot more nuanced than that, and it's, in, in the end of the day, it, it, there is a lot of variance depending on where you live. So where I live, I think including PrEP on demand as one of the indications, which is what I showed you on, on that slide with the local indications, does make sense. And I think how this rolls out in sub-Saharan Africa and some other places, it's a little premature from my perspective to say how to do this. I mean, they really, we're only at a, a demonstration project kind of level in a lot of countries. I don't know, what do you think? So I was indeed more comfortable in my initial talk because, uh, and I am totally biased by my uh, uh, my uh, living by living in Brazil and dealing with the reality we have, and so I think that for especially for our setting, it's it's more adequate to have it as a targeted approach, given all the issues I have discussed. So I am. Uh, thinking about our environment, I, am, uh, I, I don't think on-demand prep would be uh, an adequate uh, strategy to uh, implement prep. So I think we have a few minutes. Um, if we have anyone in the audience who wants to uh, share any thoughts or comments, and then um, after we take a few comments, uh, we can re-vote. So are there any uh, PrEP implementation enthusiasts, policymakers, 
people want to offer some additional insights. All right, here's. And, and please remember to identify yourself and where you're from. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Garner from Hornet, from Los Angeles. And I, I guess I'm a little troubled, to be honest, that we're even debating whether or not people have access to health care. Um, particularly coming from the United States where we've been engaged in this debate for months um, and either we believe that health care is a fundamental human right or we don't. Um, and we wouldn't be having this debate if it's life-saving medication, but for gay men in particular, PrEP is life-saving, PrEP is transformational, and they have a right to it. So either you believe it's fundamental right to health care or you don't, and you have to make an argument against it if you don't. You want me to address that? Okay. Um, so, you know, I think the issue here is, I suspect every single person in this room is for universal health care. Uh, and I would also say that the resources available for health care are not limitless. And we make decisions all the time about what we're going to buy. Uh, are we going to buy a Vastin for every single person uh, who has breast cancer for stage, you know, for early stage breast cancer? Are we going to buy the most expensive monoclonal antibody therapies, with, which are marginally better? And uh, so I, I support you, and I agree with you <coughs> that we should have PrEP on demand in the United States for, and that the demand creation, and I think we, we really agree, is what we're looking to have is a targeted approach to PrEP, which includes those people who want to have it. I think it's a little bit of a false dichotomy to say that there's this vast number of people who are going to want this intervention in a place like the United States who don't have an indication. That's probably not true. But I also think Americans sometimes have an attitude of the resources are limitless and we're just going to buy everything on the menu. And we can't buy everything on the menu. So I just want to add that I completely agree with you about the human rights approach and that, uh, and that PrEP is uh, life-saving for gay men. I couldn't agree more. So in our, uh, in our setting, we would never be able to have PrEP as a public health policy if we didn't make it the way we did, that is targeting PrEP for those who really are at higher risk and for those we could prove cost effectiveness. So if we didn't have this approach, we wouldn't have PrEP for anyone because we are not, if, if we should be able to provide it for everyone, we would not provide it to anyone. So this is the way PrEP can be implemented in a setting like ours. And, and this is what I can tell you. It's, there is nothing related to human rights. We are totally uh, in favor of having life-saving um, strategies implemented, and this, can, this needs to be done as each, each country can do. And for this country, this is how we can do, targeting it for those at higher, at higher risk. Uh, Michelle? I'm Michelle Allary, University of Laval, Quebec. So, there's PrEP and there's PrEP. So the thing is, is that there's the PrEP we have available now, and there's what could be PrEP in the future. So that's also two different issues. Just to give you an example, and also they are what we think generalized epidemic, okay, but it's not the same thing in Southern Africa and in West Africa. Okay, I just completed the demonstration project with sex workers in West Africa, okay, where the HIV incidence in that population is less than 1% per year. And the prevalence in the general population is 1%, but they have a prevalence of 15%, but very low prevalence, uh, incidence. Okay, having said that, okay, so we said these sex workers, they are at risk, we need to try PrEP with that population. Okay, at the end of follow-up, there was three quarters of women who were not taking it at all. Okay, it was, and trying to investigate why, it, it doesn't go with their life, lifestyle. They are very mobile. Taking a pill every day is too complicated for them for all kinds of reasons. They are very mobile. They don't sleep in, at the same place every day. Uh, you know there's stigmatization having intraretrovirals on you. Your fellow sex worker thinks you're HIV 
positive, she will talk against you to clients, and then you will lose clients. What is that? Very complicated. And investigating that, they say, yes, we are interested, but we need an injectable that will be long acting, like we have for contraception. Okay, so that's a clear message from these women. On the other end, there's the 30, 25, 30% who take it well, and I think that for them it should be available. But you know, one size does not fit all in that issue. That's what I think. All right, thank you. Very uh, important comments uh, from the field. Uh, Andrew. Uh, Andrew Grulick from Australia. This is really, really a live issue at the moment, and it was, it was good to have you both argue against each other and then against yourself, but it, it is really a live issue. Um, you know, it's, it, it is incredible that we've known just how effective this preventive agent is for five or more years, and almost nowhere in the world has implemented it at scale, and that's all about the cost of the drug. It's all about the cost, of, the, the cost part of the cost-effectiveness equation. Thankfully, Truvada is coming off patent this month in much of the world, and that will enable cheaper drug to be available. And when it comes down in price, that will enable us to open up and be a bit less restrictive um, about who we, who we offer to. Because the points that you were making, that no preventive drug for a condition will be effect cost effective at eight or $10,000 a year. So, you know, I really welcome what's about to happen in, in around the world and in countries where there is socialised medicine, such as Australia, such as most of Europe, then we need to then get very rapid movement and rapid scale up. Thank you. And I, I, I did just hear this week that um, a generic formulation was FDA approved, but that does not mean that's immediately going to be uh, available. There's a bunch of different legal issues that even with FDA approval of a generic formulation uh, required to take place before it can be sold and marketed. Um, well, I have the last uh, question, and, and then I'll let the speakers have the last comments, and then we'll vote again. Uh, Paul Garner from Liverpool. It, it's just a question of clari uh, clarification. How, how much is PrEP on demand um, currently available uh, in the U.S. for targeted groups, and how, how will Obamacare, if Obamacare is repealed, will that, will that make a difference to, to the options for the future? Uh, so if Obamacare is repealed, it will make a massive difference in the availability. So it depends a little bit on where you live, but if you live in a Medicaid expansion state, which is to say that the program that pays for medical care for low-income Americans, if that was expanded to cover everybody who was 138 percent of poverty or less, which are the Medicaid expansion states, then PrEP, between that and the drug assistance program, is basically anyone can get it. That it would be my, I would say that is our experience in Seattle. It doesn't mean it's easy, but anyone can get it. If uh, that goes away, we have a huge problem potentially in terms of sustaining scale up. Uh, unless, of course, the drug price just plummets, right, uh, with the generic, uh, then that would be a different circumstance uh, again, of course. Yeah, so my arguments for Brazil was all done uh, as uh, public health policy of having PrEP. So PrEP will also be probably sold in, in the pharmacies and people can, uh, will be able to purchase it. I can't tell you what will be the price, but it will be available for those who are able to, to purchase. But as a public health policy, that was, that is, this is the way that was possible to be incorporated. All right. Well, I think uh, we've really uh, heard a lot with these different aspects of the issue. So let's have one last re-vote. So those who believe PrEP um, should be available or promoted as an on-demand strategy, please raise your right hand. Okay. Uh, a little bit more. I would say 59 percent. And then uh, those who believe it uh, should not be an on-demand uh, strategy. All right, so actually a little bit more uh, as well, so about 40%. So we've actually, we've actually achieved and, and shrunk the gap of the I don't knows. So that means this uh, session has been successful at educating people, at uh, creating a more um, um, decisive aspect to the issue. So I want to thank again the speakers and thank you for attending. <laughs>